Well, how are you? Okay, welcome YouTubers. Um, if this indeed does make it to YouTube, today is the three of the three, 23, the 3rd of March, 2023. And this is Tony Roy, who will be two, Tony Roy 2.0 next week. So get ready and tune in for the new version. But for now, I've had a record-breaking group this week, and I genuinely mean that. This this group of individuals have smashed records when it comes to answering questions, pitching questions, and I'm particularly excited to see what we're going to get today. YouTubers, this is the new CITB Tony Roy twist of Project Site Setup Day. Not single, not one single complaint by either team, and um, the first team to come up, um, I'm going to say it's Mick's team, as is Mick is the CEO, and the first person to talk will be Mark. Guys, I wish you all the very best. Good luck. Oh. Right. Good morning, gentlemen. And thank you for inviting us to your offices to discuss Project Neon in Saudi Arabia. So... What is Project Neon? It is a multi-billion pound line in the sand. It runs from the Red Sea um, into Saudi Arabia in the northwest region of Tabuk province. As I said, the start of it is on the coast of the Red Sea, which is a, a beautiful area um, of the world, especially if you're into diving. The project is going to cover a distance of about 170 kilometers. It's due to last over seven years. And once it's been built, it will be the size of Belgium. There'll be four zones. There'll be the coastal zone, the desert zone, the mountain zone and the upper valley. And it will be home to more than one, uh, one million, sorry, one million people. So who are Bob's building construction and support? It was founded by our CEO, Michael, in 1985. It's one of the largest construction and support companies in the UK. So not only do we build it for you, we will then support you um, when you've moved in um, to ensure that everything is satisfactory. We are registered on the FTSE 100 and we have been awarded in nine for nine years in a row the best construction company to work for. So who are we? Michael, as I said, is our CEO. Ted is our logistics director. We have Danny, our resources director. Ryan, our health and safety director. Simon, who covers our security details. And myself, Mark, who covers all the techie stuff. Um, you will hear individually from each of those people throughout the presentation. So it will remain for me to hand over to Ted, um, who will discuss the site location. Good morning, everyone. My name's Ted, uh, and I'm going to talk you through the site location setup, uh, what we're going to do about welfare and also the traffic management plan. And then when I'm finished, Simon will give a bit more of a detailed kind of analysis into the into the welfare in terms of exactly what we're going to have where and how many kind of microwaves, uh, seating areas, et cetera, we'll need for the job. So first of all, I want to talk a bit about the kind of main uh, proposed compound location. So as you can see from the bottom left image, this is uh, the northwest of Saudi Arabia, and you can see the faint light line is um, what will become the line project. So you can see it running from the left of the screen across to the right. And the red circle is where we're proposing to put our proposed compound location. And so the right-hand image shows a zoomed-in um, version of that. So the reason why we've chosen this location is, uh, first of all, we've got this transport link coming from the north um, right down to where the compound is, and then it then runs along the coast and down through Saudi Arabia. So it makes it a very good location for uh, getting materials and people in and out of the area um, uh, via road. Uh, we've also got this area next to the sea, so we're uh, looking at potentially creating a mini port uh, to bring in materials from overseas if required as a kind of quicker uh, route in. Um, it's also a nice sheltered area uh, with that kind of bay area there, so this, it, it's protected from any uh, floods from the sea or, or, you know, wave activity or anything like that. Um, yep, yeah, go on, next slide, thank you. Um, so the main compound area, um, as I just said, will be kind of 
in the area there and it will become the heart of the line construction project. It will provide accommodation for the 1,000 plus workers working on the line as well as providing workspace for office staff and it will also have recreational facilities for the workers to enjoy during their downtime because this site is, is miles from anywhere. This will be a, um, a living site in effect. So the compound will include um, the following. So it will have a canteen, which will serve uh, breakfast and dinner um, for all the, all the guys. And um, it will also have a medical center with a helipad. So because of the size of the job, uh, we need a helipad and a helicopter to get to different areas of the project quickly. Um, we'll have a desalination plant near the sea. So that's part of the project's drive for sustainability. Instead of bus uh, bringing in water on a daily basis, it will be... Um, purified from the seawater on site. Um, we'll also have a, a large storage area for materials to be brought in and stored safely before being distributed to the project. And we'll have vehicle parking for uh, buses and, and um, plant for the for the job. Once you're inside the main compound itself, uh, restrict traffic will be restricted to make it as safe an area as possible for people to relax and enjoy. Um, we'll have obviously the, the kind of main work area, which will be the offices, induction room, canteen, prayer area, and then we'll have our recreational facilities and workers village. And then finally, the whole site will be powered by a solar farm, which will be set up. Come to the next slide. So just to, to break down how that will look, Mark has knocked up this uh, render image. He had five minutes earlier today, uh, so he's knocked this up for us. So this is kind of the workers village area. So not so much the, um, the kind of working area but the kind of accommodation and relaxing area. So you can see the solar farm in the background, which will power the site. And then uh, in the foreground, you've got the recreational facilities, such as a swimming pool, football pitches, um, running tracks and cricket pitches. Um, so obviously there's been a multicultural, multinational uh, site. We've kind of got sports to, to suit all uh, nations. And then the accommodation itself will comprise of these double stacked containers which are configured in kind of like squares. So it creates more of a commun communal um, feeling within those areas. Um, and then so looking at the um, the kind of working side of the compound, which are these yellow boxes, we'll have an area for uh, project offices, which will be stacked three high, will include induction rooms and male and female toilets. Uh, we'll have a double stack canteen with capacity to sit 500 people at once. So we're, pro we're proposing two sittings uh, for breakfast and dinner. Uh, we'll have double stacked male and female toilet facilities uh, with change rooms and we'll have a double stacked prayer area capable of fitting 500 people in. So obviously due to the size of this job, we can't just feed it from one compound. So we will have a number of satellite compounds set up uh, along the length of the project. So the idea is that in the morning, everyone will have their the breakfast and do their morning routines in the main compound. And then they'll come out, get into buses and be taken to their satellite compounds where they'll work throughout the day. And then they'll be taken back to the main compound at night. So we're proposing to set up satellite compounds every five to 10 kilometers, depending on the terrain and the activities being carried out at that stage of the project along the line. The satellite compounds would be the day-to-day -day facilities uh, used by the workers. And we'd estimate that we'd require 30 to 34 uh, compounds throughout the project so they'd not all be there at once but they would be kind of built throughout the job each compound would house uh, 50 to 100 workers uh, again depending on the activities and density of work being carried out in that area um, and each compound if we look at this kind of layout on the right hand side this is roughly how we'd um, envisage positioning the containers so we'd have uh, double stack canteens for 30 people two lots of those We'd have uh, two double stack male changing rooms. Uh, then we'd have a uh, female changing rooms, showers and toilets. Uh, we'd have two lots of double stack site offices and we'd have a uh, double stack prayer area and then male toilets and showers. So if we've gone to the next slide, we'll talk about the traffic management plan. So obviously there's going to be a lot of plant movement and a lot of material distribution required for the job. So essentially what we're proposing is creating a two lane um, each side uh, highway along the whole of the line um, and this this will carry traffic along the project so this will carry the buses that take people there in the morning and then any excavators machines uh, dumpers any other kind of project related traffic as well so each side of the carriageway will have two lanes one will be a slow lane um, for kind of heavy moving plant and the other one will be an overtaking lane for kind of buses and, and cars um, 
we've frozen the speed limit of 30 miles an hour on the main highway just because obviously it is still within a construction site area and we, we need to be careful and um every three kilometers there'll be a roundabout uh which will obviously allow people to turn around and come back down the other way but it will also have a spur off into the construction site area itself so if a, a vehicle spurs off it'll be under a five mile an hour limit and once it gets into the construction area it will have a banksman um walking alongside the the machine or um excavator throughout its time there before it gets back onto the onto the highway um so that's pretty much it for the traffic management side i'm now going to hand, hand over to simon who's going to go into a bit more detail about the ins and outs of the compound and welfare thanks very much ted our welfare arrangements will contain 50 unisex western toilets 22 arabic toilets and five disabled toilets There'll be washing facilities, including showers and foot washing, etc. First aid rooms, 1,000 storage lockers with individual padlocks issued by site and spare keys held in, in security. Changing rooms, multicultural prayer rooms, sports and recreation facilities to aid staff well-being and mental health, temperature controls and ventilation to all buildings. Within our main compound canteen, this will be a 500-seater canteen, with 20 water boilers, 20 microwaves, 30 large industrial fridges suitable for hot locations, washing up facilities, fresh drinking water, and vendor machines. Now, our satellite welfare arrangements, and due to the geographical size of the project, additional satellite compounds will be added to the layout. Approximately, depending on landscape, between five and 10 kilometers spacing between each of these. There'll be seating for up to 50 to 100 personnel, four water boilers, fresh drinking water, five microwaves, five fridges, sinks for washing up, temperature controlled ventilation, seven Western toilets, three Arabic toilets, and two disabled toilets. Male and female changing facilities, they will be separated. Five washing and shower facilities, a prayer room, first aid, and offices with power and data to support administration, i.e. hot desks. If I could just bring your attention to some of the site security details we have. These will be 24 hour security presence, visual security staff at all pedestrian and vehicle entrances, HD night vision CCTV cameras with monitoring station, three meter high mesh security fence surrounding main compound, There'll be routine foot patrols, all staff, manual and administrative, digital profile to be stored on secure system biometrics or passes. All staff will be required to access site locations through biometric control gates. And our GDPR will be adopted on site to ensure personal details are kept secure. Thanks for allowing me to talk that through with you. I'll now pass you over to Ryan for our emergency arrangements. Hi everyone, my name's Ryan. Um, on a site as big as this one, I think we can all probably agree it's likely we'll experience an emergency. So we need to put things in place to take care of everyone. I've identified a few of these emergencies with the first one being sandstorms. So in Saudi Arabia, it's a prime location for sandstorms. And in the first four months of 2022, the capital Riyadh was covered in sandstorms for 35 days. So storms like this not only pick up sand, but they also pick up dust. And this can lead to illness, it can trigger allergic reactions, and it can cause asthma attacks, along with breathing-related problems. So they need to be taken very seriously. In the event of a sandstorm, all workers must seek shelter. Anybody driving around site is going to have to stop immediately. And we'll provide P2 or P3 masks to all workers, and we'll also provide a face fitting for each worker. The second being fire. At times, we'll be experiencing extreme heat, which adds to the already huge danger of a fire on a building site. We'll be placing fire extinguishers throughout the site, in the main work areas, all the cabins, and in the high foot traffic areas. The three main extinguishers we'll be using are the water extinguishers for the likes of wood and paper, dry powder extinguishers to be used on flammable liquids, and CO2 extinguishers to be used in electrical fires. We'll be carrying out a basic service of these extinguishers every 12 months. 
Along with these fire extinguishers, we'll be placing linked fire alarms throughout site within hearing distance of each part of the site. And once one alarm sounds, they will all sound. If a fire happens on site, the workers will raise the alarm and evacuate immediately. In the induction, they will have been informed of all the fire exits and the escape routes in their work area, and we will notify the necessary emergency services. Once those emergency services are happy, under their guidance, we'll resume work. Also, with the amount of people on site, the risk of injury is huge, so we want to be making use of an on-site medical centre to better take care of our workers. This facility will be able to treat any and from minor in illness all the way to major injury, and it'll be complete with its own vehicles and its own helipad for airlifts. This centre will also aid with evacuation, making use of its vehicles and helipad to get away from site as quickly as possible. Now on to mental health. Poor mental health can lead to confusion, reduced ability to concentrate, long-lasting conditions such as diabetes, heart disease and strokes, excessive anger, hostility or violence and even suicide. So none of these things contribute to the great working environment that we want to create. So it's important that we do all we can to help people who are suffering from poor mental health, not only as fellow human beings that want to help each other, but also for the sake of our work site. The ways to promote positive mental health are things like music, reading, talking, running, eating healthy and making people feel included. So on this site, we'll be making a huge effort in promoting positive mental health to create a workplace where people want to be. We'll do this by providing the sports and leisure facilities that Ted was talking about before. These will include football pitches, tennis courts, cricket pitches, run tracks, parks, swimming and other things. So we'll also have qualified um, professionals in the medical centre. These will specialise in mental health um, and workers can speak to these people at any point. So what will this do for our project? It's going to ensure that people working on our project are going to be excited by being part of the project. And in short, that means an increase in productivity, an increase in the quality of work, and it will promote not only a workforce, but a community. I'll now pass it over to Mick, who will run you through some of the document control. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we all understand how mental health is a big issue in construction nowadays. Um, anyway, on to the less sexy subject of document control. As a principal contractor on this, uh, this particular uh, activity, it's our main concern to plan, manage, supervise and control the activities. One of the methods of control that we have in our arsenal is document control. Uh, we intend implementing an electronic document transmission system um, to obviously supply the subcontractors with the most up-to-date documentation that we have on site. We also intend keeping hard copies uh, at the, the main office site and compound. There's a list here. Um, I don't want to go through the whole list, although there are quite a lot of these that are required under legislation. Obviously, the health and safety policy, the CDM risk assessment, logistics plans, um, environmental and waste management plans, fire plans, evacuation procedures, um, site plans, POSH method statements, risk assessments. Obviously, all of these documents will be available hard copy in the main office at the main compound. Um, they need to be updated on a regular basis, which is one of the reasons that we keep them in the main compound and that we will um, make sure that the most up-to-date document is transmitted on a regular basis. Um, I think that's about all I can say about document control. Can we have the next slide, please? And that will be Mark um, telling us about the intricacies of the signage on site. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, boss. OK, um, so there's going to be multiple signs um, located around the site and the satellite offices um, on the roadways, the walkways, the pedestrian zones, the, the um, welfare areas, the offices, etc. So I've just put a couple of slides together to show you what you would expect um, and what we're going to be showing um, on the site. So. 
the first set of signage we'll be looking at our prohibition signs so these are basically signs where you know you can't do this it's it's against the rules it's against the site rules which we will we'll be covering a bit later so um the samples we got there we got a no smoking sign so we will be putting in smoking areas um around the the various locations on the site you're going to have um no access signs so there'd be areas where people can't go so we could put them at the deep excavations um, storage areas etc um, no drinking water so there'll be areas where the water isn't going to be able to be drunk um, but we will clearly say which taps can be used for drinking water there'll also be a mobile mobile phone ban on site but we will obviously put these in safe zones and safe areas where you can use a mobile phone. The second batch of warning signs are going to be um, danger signs, so hazard signs. So there'll be um, signs for, that denote electricity, so hazards of electric shock, flamm flammable storage areas. Um, if there's some lifting works being carried out, there'll be a lifting warning that uh, an overhead lift is being carried out. So, you know, you're not to walk under it and, and general hazard location signs. We're also gonna have site safety signs, which will be on the outside of the chain link fence around the compounds. This is basically to warn anybody else that isn't <laughs> associated with the site and shouldn't really be there or try and get through the fence, just to let them know that there are restrictions in place. And they're all going to be pictorial, so we will um, we will just show you these um, show you these signs and make sure that everybody can understand them. Secondly, we are going to be having um, site boards around the place, which will include things like who your fire warden is, who your first aiders are, who your site supervision. Um, is covered by who your health and safety managers are, who your health and safety directors are, project leads, um, fire plans, layouts, um, escape route plans um, and locations of um, to evacuation points, etc. So there will be multiple um, visual aids ar around the site. So the other signs you're going to see, mandatory. So generally blue, blue and white. So these are signs that we're going to be putting up that will um, give you guidance of what the, the workers need to do. So a hard hat, the site's going to be a hard hat zone. Um, hearing protection um, in places, um, overalls, and then things like pedestrian walkways, which will highlight where you can walk um, and be safe from being struck by vehicles, struck by mobile plant, lifting, etc. And then things like safety boots. The other signs that I've alluded to were the uh, assembly point, so green signs with with a white um, uh, pictorial on there. So it could be an escape route. Um, again, there'll be escape routes on site, escape routes in the offices, escape routes just walking around the welfare areas, the the workers' village. Um, we'll also highlight where assembly points will be, and because of the size of the site, there's going to be numerous assembly points. So these will be backed up with um, a numbering system or an alphabetical system. Um, and then we'll highlight where the first aid um, locations are and stretches. Sec lastly, um, firefighting signs. So as we've alluded to, there could be potential fire arrangements, um, uh, emergency arrangements on site. So we're gonna highlight these areas with the red and white signs we'll highlight where there are extinguishers, what type of extinguishers they are, what they can be used on, fire control points, which will um, sound the alarm if anybody finds a fire, um, fire phone points, so you know we can phone a, a control center and alert them. So you will find plenty of signs around the site. So these are just on the, in the compounds at the moment. So we will also be having, um, roadway signs, um, barriers on the roads, um, backed up with signs. So you know what direction to drive in, you know what lane to drive in, you know what junction to take off, uh, roundabouts, um, what particular location on the site you're at, 
Um, so there'll be numerous signs located all over the site. And uh, I've just selected a few to share with you um, just to give you that overview of, of what you can expect to see. So as it is a multicultural society that we're going to be working in, um, a lot of these will be pictorial. So there won't be any words. We're, we won't really need to have to put um, abbreviations up there in, in multiple languages. So they should all be all be um, identifiable and um, talked about in their site inductions. So there's not a lot more I can talk about signs. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Danny, um, who's going to chat about some of the site rules. Cheers, Mark. Morning, guys. Like Mark said, my name is Danny. I'm going to run you through our site rules, which, of course, must be adhered to at all times. If you have any questions about these, feel free to make a note and ask us at the end of this presentation, just so we can get through it um, right now. So site rules. Site inductions, safe work method statements, personal protective equipment, mandatory on our site, gloves, hard hat, safety boots and glasses. Accidents and incidents, alcohol and drugs, strictly prohibited. Site housekeeping, site management plan, first aid, hazardous substances, leads and power tools, behaviour, fatigue and tiredness, public areas. Noid signage around site, which Mark has just picked up on, full linking with all these site rules, body jewellery, using the right equipment for the job, smoking policy, pedestrian routes, permit to work system, traffic management systems, restricted areas and emergency procedures. Like I said, any questions upon these site rules at the end, ask your questions. I'll now hand you back to Mick to go through our site induction procedures. Okay, Danny, thank you. Um, I'll be referencing some of the points you've made in your site rule assessment um, in this. Uh, okay, let me read this uh, slide just to start with. Um, let's make a bit of a statement. We plan, manage, conduct and supervise all our work in compliance with UK legislation and best practice, ensuring all our workers have a clear understanding of their responsibility along with that of the company. Now, this is just a, um, a general introduction to the sort of induction that we will be putting together uh, as a matter of course. Um, to set up this site, uh, there'll be mobilised approximately 300 people in the first phase, rising to 1,000 when it's fully operational. The induction itself will be to familiarise new intendees with the hazards and risks that will be associated with such a high profile, high value project in the site setup phase. The inductions themselves will take place in a, a dedicated induction room, which will be signposted and through the main gate into one of the uh, porter cabin buildings. They'll take place um, initially pretty much randomly as and when is required. Uh, we understand that obviously not everybody arrives at the site on Monday morning at half past seven. So initially we will uh, be flexible, um, but what we do intend to do is run the site induction from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. Mondays and Wednesdays. As a company, we've got an exemplary health and safety record, which we intend to maintain by adhering to the site rules that Danny gave us earlier. Um, obviously, during the induction, we will be referencing the site rules and expecting compliance. We'll cover the site layout, um, fire emergency assembly points. Obviously, uh, what we probably will have to do is um, explain uh, the signage, as we say, we have we potentially have uh, different languages, different cultures, different religions. Um, one of the things that we will be doing is making sure that this induction is translated. Um, and we know that there are various dialects and languages that will be coming onto site in the contingent workforce. So we'll go through the site layout, uh, as I say, the emergency um, and assembly points, the traffic plans, the logistic plans. They're very important on this site as we consider one of the main risks to be um, traffic and general population. We want to restrict the interactions between traffic and people. We'll also uh, obviously give the welfare arrangements um, 
we've already covered some of the welfare arrangements in this uh, presentation. Um, again, we'll probably be specifically uh, trying to explain locations um, due to the possible lack of understanding of English. Um, we know that the induction will be uh, a live document. It will be ongoing um, as the site develops. There are going to be changes in the risks and hazards. Obviously, we're going to go into excav excavations, working at height. Um, we know the fire risk is quite prevalent. At this point, we'd probably ask for uh, evidence of skills. I know that's going to be difficult because of the international workforce, uh, but we'll try and maintain some sort of standards. Uh, you can see on the screen there is a one of the most recent CIBT induction um, forms which we will be having filled in. And obviously we'll ask everybody to sign that they've been briefed on the content of the induction. Um, and that's the procedure we're going to follow for the site inductions. Uh, I think we need to move on to the next slide which is other considerations and proposals. I think obviously due to the uh, the size of this project, um, we do have services issues. Uh, our main issue was power. So as we've, we've suggested earlier, we do have an intention to put a solar power site in. And this will be backed up by gen diesel generators, but obviously with the environmental impact of diesel generators, we're hoping not to use them. Um, what there is um, plans going ahead to make this solar panel site uh, a permanent setup as it's a remote site. We think that the, uh, the local community may um, get some use from uh, another source of power to the, the local grid. The water supply, again, that's going to be an issue as water supply is a premium in this part of the country, considering the uh, extremes of temperature. The desalination plant, again, we do intend to make that or attempt to make that a permanent setup. So again, it will um, improve the location and the local environment. We do have an intention of uh, developing the port, which we think will be a benefit to the local community. Um, although we do realise that this may have an environmental impact and we do realise that the importance of the area to the local community is quite high. Uh, our intention is to have as much as we can a zero carbon footprint. Um, and the uh, permanent installations, we do en intend hard and soft landscaping to put them into the environment at a, a bit of a lower impact. Um, there is a consideration for land-based wind farms, but again, we're not sure about the impact. Um, that, gentlemen, is our proposal. Thank you for your time. Please feel free to ask any questions. And as is traditional at this point, let's just give it a round of applause. Come on. Yes. Yep. Do you know, we did have, we were going to have the national anthem at that point. <laughs> <laughs> of who? Of who? Which country? Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Right, of course, yeah, of course. But we've had um, difficulties with the uh, the sounds. Okay. Well, this is this is spooky. This is the fifth version of this that's been delivered, and all five of you have pitched it in in the thirty two minute category. That was thirty two <laughs> minutes ten seconds. That is spooky. That is. Right. Could I invite the first question then, please? Yeah, can I, can I just ask what security measures you got laid out in place? Um, yeah, we uh, we 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 touched uh, we touched on the security. Which 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 bit in particular are you uh? In general, yeah. What, what was there? I, I, I may have missed that. I'm not sure. Um, I, I could go through it all again with you. It might take a bit of time. I could um, I I, I could. I can send this across to you, or you know, I can I can pass you over the, the sheet. That might be easier if you just yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Daniel. Yes. Daniel, we we have both static and um, security around the fencing on the external side. The static security will monitor the entrance uh, deliveries and any access onto the site. Um, the mobile security will check the fences along the line of the compounds, etc. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I missed that part. Sorry. 
Yeah, and there's three meter high fences around the whole area. There we go. It's on the on the screen. But, but thank you for the question, Adam. Why have you decided to go with the chain link fence instead of traditional hoarding that we use in the UK? It's cheaper and it's very windy. Um, hoarding fences do tend to blow over, even in the conditions here. Um, we we will be having a temporary works design of fencing. Uh, we, we may investigate that possibility uh, at some later stage. Thank you. Barney. Um, what are you going to do about the local tribes that might be getting inconvenienced or displaced by this project? How are you going to sort of appease them? Very good question. Uh, our so we said about leaving. We, we said about leaving some of the facilities there for the for the Bedouin tribes, like the uh, the solar panels or wind wind farms, so that they can benefit from kind of power uh, from those, and also if, uh, access to the the fresh water supply from the desalination plant. So they would benefit the Bedouin tribes as well. In terms of um, uh, relocating them, at the moment we don't see uh, this being a problem with the build route um because they're they're positioned around the coast so we don't see that we need to to move them at the moment just to add, to add on, sorry just to add on that as well we will be um communicating with them on um a daily weekly even a daily basis um on the progress of the project so they can see exactly what we're doing so we want to have an open door policy um with them so that there's no surprises but no shocks Yep, good. Anybody else? <laughs> right then. Have I got to get mine out? Tony, I can see you itching to ask a question. Uh, I've got a few. Yeah, the helipads. Like them. Nice, aren't they? Create a lot of sand, though, don't they? What's your plan for that to mitigate the sand? Uh, well, we're only going to use them in an emergency situation. Um, and obviously, we do have... Uh, PPE in place to keep everybody's uh, everybody out of the dust as a rule, but they're only for emergency use. So we're, we've mitigated the risk with regards to the uh, the emergency procedures. We'll also um, question... be building concrete pads for them, ah. so there will be an area of um, wind areas which will be concrete based rather than sand based. Good answer, Mr. Gibson. Um. You did also get a question you said about the local tribes, and they do have a lot of animals that are spooked quite easily. And noise is a big concern towards them. Not obviously that helicopter is going to be creating a lot of noise. Um. Okay. 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 Um. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Let's have a look at the next one. I've got time for one more, I think. Um. You mentioned. Um. This might be just a, a little bit of clarity for me. You mentioned with the welfare, a thousand lockers, padlocks, and spares will be kept with security is that spare padlocks or spare keys it'll be spare keys so each padlock will have two keys um they'll be issued to the workers they'll be numbered the lockers will be numbered um so that will enable the if they lose their key we can either get one cut or we can um open their locker for them to access well, i remember i remember being in a hotel in magaluf and the security if anybody went down to to get a key for their safe they knew you were using your safe. And when you were all out at night time, they went into our safes and stole lots of things from inside the safe. So what security have you got to make sure that doesn't happen? There's CCTV in um, all locker rooms and visual um, security walkabouts. Yeah. Be... And um, you, you, the, the, at the end of the day, the, the stuff that's going to be stored in lockers are going to be clothing. Uh, any value. There's, there's not going to be anything um, of high value um, there'll be on the site inductions we will make sure they're made aware that high value items should be left in their um, accommodation rooms um, and not brought to site good answer and uh, I've got I've got a bunch on here but just 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 time for quickly one more drugs and alcohol policy um, you catch somebody who's under the influence of drinking drugs what do you do with that person shoot them <laughs> they'll, they'll be removed from site 
Now, knowing what Saudi law is about being under the influence of alcohol, are you, are you how would you, how, how does that work? Do, do they get handed to the Saudi authorities? Do they, do questions get asked? What's the ramifications of being caught under the influence? At uh, this stage of the development of the site, I would suggest that we would have a um, uh, a mentor from the Saudi um, environment to assist um, in the laws and, um, and and bits like that for for Saudi law, um, as we are from the Western world. Um, we would generally deal with it in the Western world way, but as we are in the Saudis. In the Arab land, we do need to incorporate the Saudi law um, and get advice from, from them accordingly for each occasion. And that is a great answer, Gibbo. Great answer, Mr Gibson. Right, let's give it a final round of applause. Well done, guys. Well done. I'm just going to pause the recording now so you can all breathe.